I've been a park ranger in the Ozarks for nearly 20 years now, and I've seen just about everything you'd expect in these woods. Wildlife, dangerous terrain, reckless campers. But there are some things that stick with you. Things you can't shake no matter how many years pass. This is one of those stories, and I've kept my mouth shut about it for long enough. Before I settled in the Ozarks, I worked in Arizona for a few years, covering the Tonto National Forest. It was remote, desolate, the kind of place where you could go days without seeing another soul. In 1984, something happened out there that still haunts me to this day. Something they hushed up quick. But the nightmares haven't stopped. And now I think it's time people knew the truth. I was just a rookie then, fresh out of the academy, assigned to patrol a high desert terrain outside of Payson, Arizona. It wasn't long before the locals started telling me stories, warning me about certain places in the forest. They said there were areas that the old-timers wouldn't go near after dark, places where strange things happened. I brushed it off as superstition. I wish I hadn't. The summer of 84 was brutally hot, the kind of heat that sucks the life right out of you, where everything seems to shimmer in the distance. That's when we started getting reports of missing people, Campers who just vanished without a trace. Over the course of a few weeks, three separate groups disappeared from the same area, near an isolated canyon deep in the forest. No signs of struggle, no bodies, no clues. Just gone. The higher-ups called it accidents, chalked it up to dehydration, getting lost, animal attacks. Whatever explanation would keep people calm, but we knew better. The locals had been talking, whispering about something, whispering about something much darker. It was late August when I got the call. A search party had found the body. I was assigned to go out with a team to investigate. We were told to keep it quiet. No press, no locals. Just a small group of rangers and a couple of men from some government agency I'd never heard of before. They didn't tell us much, just that we were to assist and follow orders. When we got to the site, I'll never forget what I saw. The body, or what was left of it, was torn apart, almost unrecognizable. Not like an animal attack, either. No bite marks, no claw marks. It looked like something had ripped this person to shreds. The skin was peeled back in places, organs scattered across the dirt, and the look on his face, that expression. It was pure terror. Whatever happened to him, he saw it coming. One of the guys from the agency, tall, lean, wearing a suit that didn't belong in the middle of the desert, was already there when we arrived. He didn't seem surprised by the scene. In fact, he barely even glanced at the body. He just looked at us and said, we need to find the others. The others? I asked. You mean there's more? He didn't answer me, just motioned for us to follow him deeper into the canyon. The air was thick with something wrong. It's hard to describe. The wind felt off like it wasn't moving naturally. In the quiet, it was deafening. Even the animals weren't making a sound. We hiked for hours, the sun setting behind the jagged cliffs, casting long shadows over the canyon floor. And then, just as the last light faded, we found them. The other bodies. There were three more laid out in a rough circle, their limbs bent and broken, twisted in ways that shouldn't have been possible. Like the first body, they'd been torn apart, their faces frozen in that same expression of terror. But there was something else. Around them, carved into the dirt, was a symbol. An intricate pattern of lines and spirals, too precise to be an accident. What the hell is this? One of the other rangers asked, his voice shaking. The man in the suit didn't answer. He just knelt down and traced the symbol with his fingers. It's not the first time we've seen this, he muttered, almost to himself. What do you mean? I demanded. What the hell are we dealing with out here? He stood up slowly, brushing the dirt from his hands. This isn't a natural predator. It's something, older, something that's been here a long time, longer than any of us. Before I could ask him to explain... The wind picked up, howling through the canyon like a scream. And that's when we saw it. 
At first, it was just a shadow, something moving at the edge of the canyon, too fast to make out. But as it got closer, we saw its shape, tall humanoid, but wrong. Its limbs were too long. Its skin stretched tight over a skeletal frame, and its eyes, those dark, empty eyes, locked onto us like it was studying us, deciding which one of us to take first. We opened fire, every one of us unloading into it, but the bullets didn't slow it down. It moved like smoke sliding through the air, its body flickering in and out of view as it closed in on us. The man in the suit shouted something, but I couldn't hear him over the wind and the gunfire. And then, just as quickly as it had appeared, the thing was gone vanished into the darkness of the canyon, leaving nothing behind but the smell of rot and decay. We never found it. The government covered everything up, of course. The deaths were blamed on animal attacks, exposure, whatever they could make people believe. But I knew better. I'd seen it, and I knew it wasn't over. I left Arizona after that, transferred to the Ozarks, hoping I could leave it all behind that whatever that thing was would stay buried in the desert. But now, as I patrol these woods, I can't shake the feeling that it's not gone, that it's something much bigger than just one place. So if you're ever out there camping in the wilderness and you hear the wind start to howl, hear something moving just beyond the trees, turn back, get out. Because what killed those people in Arizona, it's still out there, and it's hunting. I didn't know where to post this, but I guess this is a good place as any. I've been a long lurker of the horror community and finally decided to share one of my stories that I've tried to block out of my mind. The following story took place on July 19, 2011. So a little background. Every summer since I was seven, I would go out to California to visit my dad. He would take me up and down the state, visiting all the cool places a kid wanted to go to. As I got older, he started to take me to national parks like Yellowstone, Redwoods, and Yosemite. During this year in particular, he wanted to go back to Yosemite and rent one of those tents you see in a village campsite. I was really excited since the last time we were there. We stayed in a hotel that was nearly two hours outside of the park. He also mentioned we should hit the park's infamous mist trail that goes up Vernal Falls again since. Well, last time I had difficulty hiking up it because my feet were killing me. He even hinted that he wanted to go down the John Muir Trail that was on the top of the falls. Now, John Muir, for those of you that don't know, he's a bit of California legend he sought out to preserve some of the wilderness lands in the United States. His most notable accomplishment was establishing Yosemite as a national park in 1890. But even after his death, the man had a hospital and a middle school named after him. The last bit of information that I want to point out here was during that year, Yosemite set a record of its waterfalls being three times more powerful than ever before due to the amount of snow and rain it had received during the winter and springtime. I think it was even featured on the nightly news when Brian Williams was on there at the time. On the morning of the hike, both my dad and woke with excitement. The two of us had trained for this day with me being on the cross-country team for my school and him working out at the gym. We were more than ready to take on such an amazing trail. We packed up our backpacks, put our hiking boots on, and drove my dad's SUV to the trailhead parking lot. When we got there, it was around 8.30, and the parking lot was already full. I guess there were a lot of people eager to see this once-in-a-lifetime moment. We had to park all the way over where Curry Village was. This will be important for later. After a mile and a half, we finally reached the trailhead now. The first part of the mist trail is paved, and it has some steep hill inclines. Nothing too extreme. After you reach the end of the paved trail, you go across a footbridge over the stream that's at the bottom of the falls. However, that little stream is full-blown rapid river. 
Now keep in mind the park at the time had a very amount limited signs and guardrails around the water areas, so it wasn't uncommon to see people wander off the trail to be by the stream to sunbath or dip their feet in. Kids would also want to go in and splash each other like they're at a water park. My dad and I were also guilty of going off the trails to take pictures and such. Some of my pictures that I provided for you guys shows just how easy it was to be by the water. As for the park rangers, some of them didn't really mind it at the time. In fact, it was kind of nice having people explore the park, just as long as they were cautious and used good judgment. I haven't been back to Yosemite since this event, so I don't know how strict they are now with this trail. I forgot to mention this earlier, but the trail isn't for everybody. Once you pass the footbridge, it's all uphill, and you have climb up these stone steps. Some of the steps had eroded or washed away over the years, which made it extra difficult to climb in certain areas, especially when it got to be really narrow. You also have to combat the mist from the falls and not lose your footing. Otherwise, you might fall over the edge and go into the water. After our short break, my dad and I started to head up Vernal Falls. And like I mentioned earlier, the mist from the falls was intense, but it was rewarding in a way. When we got to the top, it was almost noon and we were ready to tear open our lunches. But before we did that, we went over to the John Muir Trailhead while taking some along the way. The trail wasn't too long, but if we wanted to get back to the parking, we would have to take another trail, which took way longer than the mist trail. We came to the conclusion that we would think about it during lunch since our hunger is now overwhelming. That's when my dad asked me if we should eat by the falls or find a quieter place. Till this day, I still don't know what made me blurt out that we should find a quieter spot away from the falls and the other noisy tourists. My dad agreed, and we made our way up the river to the point that it became a small creek and sat down at a picnic area. There was no one in sight, and all that we could hear was the water flowing in the stream and the birds chirping. As we were finishing up, we saw a bunch of people coming from every direction, and they weren't walking or running. It was as if they were in a rush to get somewhere, but didn't where to go. We didn't think anything of it and decided to head over to the stream before we went back to the falls. Now to get to the stream, you had to walk over a bunch of rock that were fun to climb and jump over. We approached one such jump over a gap. My dad went first making it look easy while I, on the other hand, had to get a running head start. As I made my way over the gap, I heard something hiss and sort of jump at my leg. Upon landing, I quickly turned around to see a coiled-up rattlesnake in the gap with its eyes fixated on me. Luckily, he didn't bite me, and I was a safe distance away from it if it tried to do anything. I called out for my dad, who was like Indiana Jones when it comes to snakes. I pointed out the snake. And when he saw it, his face turned a pale white. I laughed as he backed away in fear, and as he did that, another hiker was making their way right for the gap. I immediately told him to go around Gap, and he had a confused expression on his face. Then one came around to our side and saw the rattlesnake. He took out his phone to take pictures and video of the snake. At this point, my dad had enough of the snake and made his way to the stream, to which I followed him, hoping that the guy won't get bit. The creek was pretty shallow and was hard to believe that it turned into this roaring waterfall. I stayed at the edge of the creek to soak my bandana in the cold while my dad went in a little further and bent down to do the same. Then all of a sudden this Middle Eastern guy came out of nowhere and started talking to my dad in frantic voice. He said something along the lines of, Sir, you're not allowed to be in there. Please get out of the water. Like I mentioned earlier, it wasn't uncommon to see people by the water, especially near a small stream like this one. It was very odd, though, because this guy wasn't a park ranger, nor was he dressed for hiking. My dad slowly got up and said to the guy, We're just soaking our sweatbands before we head back down. Everything is fine. The man grew more concerned. Sir, please, you need to get out of the water now. It's very dangerous. I just saw three people die right from where you are standing. Then the man turned to me and said, Son, if you value your father's life, you have to get him out of there. 
I'm completely speechless at this point, and my dad is ignoring this man's pleas. But before either one of us could say or do anything, the man runs off trying to warn other tourists that were getting close to the water. After he was out of sight, my dad got out, and we grabbed our backpacks and headed toward the falls. As we were walking, I asked my dad what the guy meant when he said that he saw three people die just by standing in a small stream. He looked at me confused as well, but reassured that maybe they fell and hurt themselves or something. That confused me even more. The stream is powerful as the falls, so how could someone lose their footing and die? The thought didn't last long because I was then distracted by the crowd of people that were gathered around the area where I had spotted the rattlesnake. We about to find a park ranger so that no one would get hurt, but for some odd reason there wasn't one in sight. We kept walking till we finally made it to the falls, and at that point we were already exhausted from the hike up, then decided to go back down the mist trail. When we got to the trail head, there was a large crowd of people blocking the trail. Impatient, we made our way through the group of confused hikers, and then that's when we saw the caution tape all along the trail itself. There must have been 15 park rangers scouting the area and telling hikers coming up the trail to turn back immediately. Someone asked one of the rangers why they were closing off the trail, and in the most calm and professional tone, the park ranger said, Oh, everything is all right. There was a dead animal that was found on the trail, and the smell is really unbearable. We're trying to remove it, but for now the mist trail is closed until further notice. Everyone here will have to take the John Muir Trail to get back down. I immediately knew something was off. There was way too much caution tape for just one dead animal, and why were they tapping off the edges that are near the falls? Also, the two park rangers that were on the trail weren't looking on the trail itself. They were looking down into the water. Then I heard static on one of their radios. All I could make out was something about missing hikers. The John Weir Trail turned out to be a pretty nice detour. That is, until we hit the Panorama Trail. It was caked with horse droppings, and uh, the smell was as bad as you could imagine. But it went on for ten miles. We caught up with some of the other hikers along the way, and they were speculating what actually happened. One said that it was a bear that died, and the rangers had to get a dump truck to haul it away. Another said it was a moose or a deer. I swear it's pretty funny what people come up with in these types of situations, but all them would wrong. About two hours later, we all finally got to the bottom of the trail. My legs feel like jelly at this point, and we still needed to get to the parking lot. On our way there, we spotted a park ranger standing guard at the mist trail head. Curiosity got to the better of my dad, and he went over to the ranger and asked what actually happened. The ranger, knowing that my dad wasn't buying the whole dead animal story, let out a sigh, and with a hesitant expression on his face, said, There are these three hikers that were a part of this church group. They all decided to go over the railings that were near the top of the falls to take some pictures. The first victim went in the water and eventually lost their footing and fell. It was only a matter of time for the current to take him. Down the waterfall. Then two more hikers from the group went in and tried to save him. But they also lost their footing and was overtaken by the current. It was at this point people who were witnessing this occurred discouraged others from jumping in unless they wanted to have the same happen to them. If the drop didn't kill them instantly, then the rocks below would have torn them apart. The trail was closed shortly after in fear of one, their bodies being on it. I sat there mortified. If we had decided to eat our lunch there, we would have been one of the many dozens of people that witnessed this horrible event and do nothing but stand there watch as three people fell to their fate. What the ranger said next still haunts me to this day. Due to the falls and rapids being as powerful as they are now, we can't recover the bodies until it dies down in October or November. My heart sunk into my chest thinking about the friends and family members of the victims and that it's going to be a while for there to be a recovery. We got into the car, our legs were aching from that 12-mile hike and for the rest of the way back it was silent. I never brought it up again to my dad, and that was that. 
I still think about the Middle Eastern guy telling my dad to get out. I don't know what I would have done if my dad was one of those victims. This just goes to show you that no picture is worth risking your own life. Once when I was backpacking and visiting Auschwitz, I poorly planned my train and got to the camp right before they closed for the day, so I was unable to do the tour. Me being poor and not wanting to spend dollars, and also there not being any accommodation in town, I decided I'd just walk around behind the camp and sleep in some tall grass by the river. I was fairly inconspicuous in where I was sleeping, so I felt good about the spot. Sort of one of those, well, I'm going to sleep now. Hopefully nothing bad happens to me, things you do when you're 19. Flash forward to 3 a.m. and I wake up to the incredibly loud sound of what I can only describe as a very loud rock or weight being thrown into the very middle of the river. I got up and scanned around, but it was pitch black and I didn't hear any footsteps or other human noises. The next day, when I did the tour, I learned that the river was a dumping ground for the ashes from the crematorium. I'm not a huge believer in ghosts or anything paranormal like that, but I don't really have any other explanation for it. So this story is from a few years ago, but my mother and I remember every single detail of what happened. However, I would like some advice. I'm almost 100% sure I saw a skinwalker, but the location doesn't add up. When I was in 7th or 8th grade, my mom and I were driving home from a therapy session of mine. Note, nothing for being schizoid, just depression and such. It was winter and a full moon, because I remember the snow glowing under the moonlight. It was only 6 p.m., but really dark out, because you know it's in the middle of winter. So we were going about 55 miles per hour when this thing crossed and stopped in front of us. The only way I can describe it is that it was if you combined a deer, a dog, and a human. It stood about as tall as our windshield. It had the legs of what I can describe as a deer. Its back was hunched over and walking on all fours. It had the head of a dog, note. It didn't have ears or a dog nose, but its eyes were white and it didn't have a tail. The freakish thing about this creature was its skin. It wasn't a canine with mange or anything. It had actual human skin all the way down its legs. Too long to be dog legs. It smelled of rotting meat, and some parts of the flesh were broken open, like if you would scrape your knee. It was pale white, and you could see its veins. And this thing was fast, like it stood there and just ran across the road in the blink of an eye. My mom and I had to pull over to calm down. We both saw it. This sighting was in southeastern Ohio, between Gallipolis and Athens. Thanks to someone on Reddit, I now believe what I saw was a crawler. I haven't seen the creature since, but it still haunts me to this day. And on that highway, I'm scared to see it again. Can anyone tell me what I saw? Thank you in advance. Note, I'm posting this on different boards to see what others say. Note 2. Thank you guys for the responses. So far we have a few ideas of what this thing could be. Crawler, dogman which I really don't know about from descriptions, that's not what I saw. Not deer or wendigo, though I highly doubt it to be honest. I have recently become really interested in Reddit threads about real encounters and creepy stories from fellow Redditors, mainly because I have never personally experienced anything of the sort, and I find it fascinating. Anyways, I just happened to stumble onto this subreddit through a comment. The first two pictures I saw on this page sent chills to my core. Typing this five minutes after, I still feel these chills. 
I had a sighting of something, one of the only true unexplained experiences I have had, and when I saw the illustrations posted here, this vivid memory instantly came back to me. My experience happened maybe five or six years ago. I lived in a small college town right on the border of Minnesota in central Wisconsin. My two friends, Blake and Eric, and I had a couple of drinks at my place, and we decided to go to the park near the middle of town for a walk. I would say the time were around 1, 2 a.m. Blake had just seen an episode of The Office where everyone was doing hardcore parker around the office, and we had previously been joking and laughing about it. So as we parked in the parking lot, he hopped out and started off on his parker run. Eric and I ran after him laughing, and when we finally caught up to him, we slowed down and started walking the path. We neared the northern part of the path where it starts turning right to go back around the park. On the outer side of the path, there was a clearing in the trees on the hill leading down to the river below, covered in a foot or two of brush. We debated heading down to the river, and as we got to the edge of the path, we saw it. The joking immediately halted as we stood frozen for a few seconds, our eyes adjusting to the darkness. About twenty feet down the hill, this thing was hunched over, facing away from us. It must have heard us and turned its head to look towards us. From what I remember of the second or two I saw of its face, it had an almost wolf-like appearance, and its eyes were terrifying. It continued to turn towards us while standing upright on its hind legs, and immediate fear overcame me. I knew right away that whatever this thing was, it did not look friendly and was like nothing I had ever seen before. All three of us absolutely lost it and ran to Eric's car as fast as we possibly could. I don't think any of us looked back even once until we got into the car. We asked each other what the F that thing was, and not a single one of us had even close to the slightest explanation as to what we saw. I stumbled upon an old scary story book at our library, and there was an old story from western Wisconsin about the Wendigo, and that was the closest explanation as to what I saw that I came across. Searching for a Wendigo on Google, I find very similar characteristics within the top illustrations I was talking to one of my really good friends a while back in 2006, and we just somehow ended up talking about weird stuff we've seen in our lives. He brings up the story of how one of our friends and her friends had a scary encounter. They were walking through a neighborhood at night and just ended up at a park outside of the Green Valley Forest Preserve in Naperville, Illinois, which is a very big forest. So they're walking towards the park when they see what they thought was a tall person on top of the swing set. So they stop and wonder who would be standing on a swing set at 10 p.m. at night alone. So they get closer and the creature turns around. It was a hairy creature with bright orange eyes standing upright at around 8 feet tall. It looked at them for about 5 seconds. Then it jumped straight down without making a sound, sprinting away. They got scared and ran back to their car and went home. As soon as one of them got home, she was sitting in her house when banging started on her house. She hadn't called up one of her friends, supposing it was him, telling him to stop. He told her it really wasn't him. He said he was home and the same thing was happening with him. They never saw the creature again. There have been a few more sightings by people who say they'll wake up early in the morning around 6 a.m. and will see the creature watching them when they're outside. Everyone who describes it describes it as a werewolf. So here's my story. I and a couple of my friends went to the same forest preserve at night just to hang out and have a couple of beers. We've heard about the story a couple of times, but thought they were just pulling our chain. But we were there for like about an hour, and we finished our beers and decided to leave. Well, my friend went to relieve himself near the edge of the woods, and we said we'd wait for him. So he finishes up, walks back to us, and we're just walking back to my car in normal conversation, and he's not talking. We just asked him, why are so quiet? So he just told us to hurry up and move fast to the car. I said, what's going on? 
So we get to our car, and he seems to be fine, and all is forgotten. I saw him every day after that, and everything was normal. Then a while later, we're sitting in a restaurant eating, and I brought up the park and told him we should all go do that again. And then he flat out told me when he was doing his business on the edge of the woods, he saw two glowing orange eyes looking at him from about 20 feet away and getting closer. He didn't see the creature due to the fact it was almost pitch black, but he saw the eyes getting closer and he got scared. He told me he didn't tell us that night because he didn't want to scare us and he thought we wouldn't believe him. After these many years, I wonder how many other people saw this creature. A few years ago, my friends and I were exploring near our usual camping area when we came across a small entrance to a cave. As we approached the entrance, we noticed this white piece of wood lying directly in front of the cave that looked to be about three feet long. As we finally make our way to the entrance, we realize it wasn't a piece of wood and instead a vertebrae. We just stood in silence for a while. Probably way too late, but this was a pretty good one. A few years back, I was about 12 at the time, 21 now. My family decided to take me and a bunch of my friends up hiking and camping at a spot we go to often by the river. However, a few months earlier, two women had been murdered, shot, on a different trail a few miles up the highway. So I was a little skeptical in my 12-year-old state of mind, but we went anyway. That night, we camped on the rocky beach between the river and the woods. No one else was in the area, and all the cars we had seen had left before dark. At about ten in the pitch black, we began to hear chopping noises from the woods, very loud and really close. Our dogs started freaking out, and all my friends and my sister and I were pretty nervous. My dad, however, had balls of steel and decided to circle the area and enter the woods from the flank of where the noise was coming from to see what was up. I was very nervous and our dogs were continuing to bark. When he got into the woods, the chopping stopped and did not pick up again until he returned to our campfire. We left the next day and never found out what it was. A friend and I had some time to kill before heading to another friend's house for the night. We decided to take a stroll down a popular walking path in my town that runs through a field of tall, thick brush, so tall that you cannot see over it. So we're about 15 minutes into the walk when we decide that we've gone far enough, and it was time to turn around and walk back to our car. On the way back, I noticed a large, dark green electrical box in the distance alongside the path which was weird because there's nothing around to power. As we got closer, I said to my friend, I really don't remember that electrical box being there before. As soon as my friend said, Yeah, that's weird, me either, I shit you not. The electrical box shot into the brush at instantaneous velocity, uninterrupted by any bushes or trees that may have been in the way. We both stopped in our tracks and stood there speechless for a solid 60 seconds, looking forward with our jaws hanging open. We were both in such disbelief at what we just saw that we could not form a coherent thought. We eventually looked at each other and decided we had to keep walking anyway to get to the car, so we walked up to where the box was and there was absolutely no sign of anything breaking into the brush. This thing easily would have broken a few bushes down or snapped a tree branch as it looked exactly like a 4x5 bike. Five large electrical box, and it was shot into the brush as if it was afraid of U.S. This is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me, and it's not even a cool story to tell my other friends because it's about a haunted electrical box. But it was really scary at the time, and still is when I think about it. I don't walk there anymore.
Me and a few buddies decided to go for a nature walk in some of the dense woods of Nepa. As we were walking through the woods, we heard whispers as if two, three people were following us and just watching. We all got paranoid, but since we were bigger guys, we weren't that afraid. We all decided to stop and make a small fire around 2 p.m. to cook our lunch and sit down for a while. As we were sitting, we saw a few figures running past our camp, and paranoid me pulls out the trusty 1911 in case it got hot and heavy. We searched and found footprints, but they were extremely tiny, like women's size five shoe size. But these figures were at least six foot tall. It still creeps me out to this day, and we have never been back there again. So when I was about 13, me and my parents decided to visit Gettysburg one weekend as my dad loved history and my mom mostly likes looking at the old battlefields as well as browse antique shops. It was early Saturday evening and we had scheduled a ghost walk in which a tour guide took us around various haunted locations around the town itself and the nearby woodland and gave detailed stories behind each location. Well, our first stop was a place called the Sweeney House, where a short skirmish between Union and Confederate troops once took place, along with snipers being positioned in the attic. There weren't that many of us in the group, but the tour guide let us explore the downstairs of the house before we headed up to the attic. I broke off from my parents and eventually found myself in the kitchen area. I was taken by surprise when I saw a man about six feet tall in a dark blue Union uniform standing there looking out a window, holding what I'm assuming was a musket over his shoulder. I'd say he was about mid-thirties. Now my original thought was that maybe he was a reenactor just exploring the town and whatnot. But as soon as I started to enter the kitchen, he took off with a brisk walk towards the front door where we came in. But as soon as I looked around the corner to get an eye on him, he was gone. I remember feeling not scared, but just confused. Did I really see an actual ghost, I thought to myself? I eventually found my parents and told them about it, and they gave their typical, you, huh, sure response. That was the only ghost encounter I've ever had, and I still think about it occasionally. Edit. And the strangest thing is that he didn't look like your typical ghost from the media as a floating gray transparent apparition. It was like he was actually there standing in front of me like you'd stand in front of me. I think my story applies because I believe it is also Civil War related, but happened in Virginia. On August 25th at 9 p.m. in Fairfax Station, Virginia off Henderson Road, I believe that I heard a phantom ghost train whistle in or near my yard. I have lived in my home for 13 years and I have never heard something so loud or so close to my home. On rare occasion over the years, I have heard a very distant train whistle from what I assume would be from the Vrie or Amtrak trains, Burke or Clifton, but nothing as loud as what I heard that night. My husband happened to be walking the dog in the backyard at the time, and I was already in bed. When he came inside, he said the hair on his arms was standing on end and that the whistle sounded like the train was in the backyard. I'm wondering if anyone else has ever experienced something like this. I have since done a little research and wondered if our experience had something to do with something paranormal, a residual energy imprinted in the environment. I have learned that Fairfax Station was originally a station of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. It was known as Lee's Station during its first year. During the Civil War in August 1862, Claire Barton tended to wounded Union and Confederate troops at the station after the Second Battle of Bull Run, minus ass, with headquarters at nearby St. Mary's Church, very close to our home. I'm a very logical person, and I just can't explain what I experienced. Maybe there's a connection considering the timing of this happening in late August of this year. 
It was obviously a very traumatic time during the Civil War, and particularly in August of 1862, in this immediate area, a time full of pain and suffering. I can't help but think that Maybe the environment absorbed some of that energy, and the conditions must have been just right on the 25th for me to possibly hear the ghost train whistle so loud and clear. I'd be interested in hearing if anyone else has a similar story to share. Thanks for reading. When I was about 13, I was staying with a friend in January in the foothills of the Rockies in Colorado. While we were at his buddy's house, I walked to get food from a nearby gas station. On a small, windy country road, a car took a turn too fast, skidded on the ice, and rode over in my direction. I was lucky that there was woods right to the side, and the dense trees saved me from the vehicle. As I ran away, I looked back, and I could only see his arm dangling limply out of the broken driver's side window. I was scared, and I still get shivers about it today. I think the person ended up dying minutes later from injuries. But for three days after I had strange dreams, they were very short, just small details. The feeling of grass, the moon, and a name. I only remember the last name now, Alton on the fourth night, I had gone to bed early in an effort to get sleep. I ended up drifting off around 10 p.m.-ish, according to my friend's family. I heard a noise and woke up, but when I opened my eyes, I was laying right in front of a grave with the name Alton on it. It was a small village cemetery surrounded by pine trees. I would say it was less than 900 square feet. Despite it being mid-January in the mountains, there was no snow past the gate and in the cemetery. I was very cold and scared and managed to locate a fire watchtower where they drove me back to my friend's house. According to them, they went to check on how I was doing at around 1 a.m. and I wasn't in bed. Their home security said that I had left their back porch at 12, 40-ish in the morning. When the park rangers picked me up, it was almost 3 a.m. I explained my story to my friend's family and they told me that there was no cemetery behind their house. I told them what the area looked like, and they said they had a clearing like that, but no graves. They offered to take a look if I would lead them, but I was too shaken. I also remember there being a small gate in his fence. I had to chase a stray ball. But before I went back home, that gate was gone, and it was just a solid fence. I don't know what happened, and I need answers. It's been bugging me recently, and I decided to ask about it. Please, if you have any solutions, respond. I wish to keep my name to myself, but I am willing to provide my account of what happened. This is a first-hand account of an encounter that I had with a creature of unknown origin. It was about five years ago, late at night, I went for a walk in the dark to clear my head one night when I got the feeling that I was being followed. Before I could say anything, a dark fur-covered creature lunged out of the nearby bushes. It looked like a large man crossed with a wolf. It had deep green eyes and an elongated snout. The thing smelled like a rotting deer carcass, and it was very heavy. It slammed into me, knocking me to the ground where it stood over me and growled as it looked me in the face. I kicked it, and it yelped before swiping at me, cutting my arm with its sharp claws. I was sure it was going to kill me, but then a noise similar to a car with a broken muffler backfiring scared it, and the creature ran away. Strangely, my arm no longer felt like it was bleeding, and the cut wasn't hurting anymore. My shirt sleeve was torn, but when I wiped away the wet blood from my arm, there wasn't even a scratch left behind. I was sure that it was just a bad dream, and so I headed back home. I never reported this because I was certain that nobody would believe me, and because it has been haunting me every day since. I haven't seen this creature since it ran off into the woods when that sound scared it off, but I sometimes worry that it might come back. I also don't know why the scratch on my arm was gone moments after the thing ran off. 
Everything I've found about it online has said that it was a werewolf, but I don't think those are real. It also isn't like the dogman or any other similar kind of creature. If you have heard of anything else like this, I would be interested to hear about it. Thank you. Growing up in rural Ohio, I lived on a stone road. I used to take the country roads to the closest town, which passed an old cemetery in the middle of a wooded semi-swamp. I used to pass there every day on my paper route as a kid in the 80s. Way in the back of the small cemetery was an old Washington Monument-shaped grave that was broke at the base. The top section was a few feet away from the base. Every day I would lift that top section back onto its base and go ride do my route. The next day, without fail, the top section would be in exactly the same place. I did this every day for about two years. One day I looked at where the top section was laying and I saw a very small glint of white marble poking through the ground. I moved the grass away and the dirt away and uncovered a small grave of a dead infant that matched the same last name as the name on the grave. I never lifted the top section ever again. Every time I go visit home, which is now a couple thousand miles away, I go back to that cemetery, and that top section is still laying on top of that infant grave. Had an experience with a drug plane in the middle of the night being loaded and unloaded. I have never been unarmed since. Edit. It was in the American Southeast at my buddy's farm and hunting camp. A couple of us, just college-age kids, were out there fishing and drinking a couple beers and cooking burgers and hanging out until we got tired. It was getting late and at exactly midnight we heard an unmistakable single-engine airplane start up. He has an airstrip about 50, 100 yards from his cabin. We could clearly hear it taxi down the airstrip and then take off into the pitch-black night with zero light. All of a sudden, IDFs has cranked up from the back of the airstrip and started hauling ass our way. I yelled to turn off the radio and douse the lights and get inside so we could pretend we weren't there and didn't see anything. I asked my buddy if he had any guns. Zero. Anyway, they came by the cabin, stopped like they were thinking about what they should do with us, and then kept booking it on the IDFs. The creepiest thing is that they had to have waited and waited to take off until they couldn't wait any longer. They were listening to us, drinking beer and kicking the shit all evening. So I used to live in a rural area growing up. We had a neighbor across the street, but he had a long driveway and they could have maybe heard a scream if it was really loud. But one night I was about 12 maybe and I was babysitting my younger brother who was 10. I was upstairs watching TV and he was downstairs playing video games. Where I was sitting I could see car lights from people driving on the gravel road. The gravel road was a decently busy road during the day, so it wasn't uncommon for a handful of cars to be on it at night. But this night I saw a car drive super slowly back and forth by our house. It at one point drove into our driveway and around our place. I started freaking out and locked all the doors. The car slowly left the house and I felt a little better. About a half hour or so, I saw a car speeding past our house on the gravel road, followed by a cop car. I never found out what had happened, but it had me freaking out. Another story wasn't in rural area and is actually kind of funny. So I lived in my house in a suburb of a city. I had a ring camera doorbell because someone had been cutting my Halloween light decorations. Well, Halloween had passed and I didn't have anything outside anymore, so wasn't too worried about anyone appearing on the caring on the camera at night. I was up late one night since I had just worked a night shift. 
It was like 2 a.m., and all my other roommates were at work when my phone started getting notification from my ring that someone was at my front door. I started freaking out because my roommates weren't going to be home for hours, so it wouldn't be them. I finally worked up the courage to open the Ring app on my phone to see what was on the camera. It turned out it was a deer eating some leaves on one of my front bushes. I felt happy and a little stupid for freaking out lol. I was hiking in New Hampshire during college, and something happened that, at the was time, was unexplained. I'd been hiking a few times before, and my two friends hadn't ever been. One from a beach town in Florida, one just a city person from Long Island. But there was a well-known spot close to our college. It was a short hike, maybe two miles, but they were definitely unprepared. We got a late start, and it was fall, so I remember grabbing a random flashlight I had laying around my dorm. They didn't think about that and underestimated how long it would take for people who'd never gone hiking to get to the top. We got there no problem, but about ten minutes into our descent down, it started to get dark real fast. So I brought out my flashlight. All is going well until it starts dying. It was a miracle a college student had a flashlight in the first place, and this was a time before everyone had iPhones. I had a flip phone, and they had Blackberries. We think we're pretty close to trailhead, but still speed up a bit. It still wasn't pitch black, but it was getting very close, and the flashlight was fading in and out. All of a sudden, in the distance, we hear a gut-wrenching shriek that wasn't human. If I remember, it was more of an echo through the trail, and it didn't sound too close. But what the hell did I know? The three of us were petrified. We didn't even say anything to another. We just all started running, because we had no idea what it could be. It felt so surreal to be running from an unknown thing, and the only sound was of our feet hitting the ground. And it felt deafening to me. I can't even recall hearing any incests or birds in the woods. Just footsteps racing to get the F out. It didn't take us more than ten minutes to get down, which was such a relief to see her car. We got in and just booked it. I barely remember the car ride back. I honestly think I blacked out in combo of post-adrenaline fear and relief. I do remember we didn't even talk about in the car. No up was that, or that could have gone really bad. I honestly don't think we said a word that night or ever again. It was too scary and weird to think about. It wasn't until years later, reading a similar story on here, that someone said it was probably a mountain lion. I went on YouTube and searched the sound and had immediate chills. It was 100% a mountain lion. If you've never heard one, it's truly horrifying. It doesn't even sound to this world. So yeah, in hindsight, we probably shouldn't have run. But man, screw that sound a mountain lion makes. This incident took place in a small town in Oklahoma with a decent-sized native population. Anyway, this guy is actually Mexican. Nicest dude you would ever want to meet. He was about 30, five at the time, and had a family. An honest, good-natured guy that I could never see making something up for no reason. It was late one night, and we were talking about an abandoned building at the campus of a small community college that used to be housing. Supposedly, it was haunted. A friend and I wanted to sneak in and check it out. He advised us not to, and mentioned that he once lived in an apartment on campus there, and some strange stuff happened. Stuff like hearing footsteps upstairs in a different apartment, and a fridge opening and closing. Then someone mentioned the upstairs was empty. He figured someone was squatting there, so at 1 a.m. he heard it and grabbed a bat. There was a staircase that led up there, so no way someone could have gotten out by the time he started up. He opened the door, nothing but an old, non-working fridge on the opposite end. He didn't stay long after his doors began to open and shut on their own. 
but he claimed that wasn't nearly as freaky as the last time he was in Mexico. He was driving back to the U.S. after visiting family. His wife was in the passenger seat, asleep. He wasn't too far from the border, so he decided to keep driving a little after midnight instead of stopping somewhere for the night. It was sort of a desert-type road. He says he was going about 65 miles per hour when he noticed something in his peripheral vision out in the darkness out of the passenger window. Something was out there, and it was keeping up with him. Obviously, this shook him up. He hit the gas 70 miles per hour, 75, 80, 85. It was still keeping up. At this point, it was almost too absurd that he thought it was just his tiredness playing tricks on his eyes until it changed directions. Instead of moving parallel with his car, it began to angle back toward the road in a manner to intercept the vehicle like in Op Story. As it got closer, more light hit it, and he said in no uncertain terms, it looked like a human. It was still slightly shadowed from the darkness, but he was certain it was a humanoid form. He accelerated to 90 miles per hour, and a few seconds later it angled back into the darkness and was gone. As he finished the story, I could tell his eyes were welled up and his hands were trembling. And this was a tough, no BS dude. It physically struck him to the core, just to recall it. Not surprisingly, he said he is never going back to Mexico. Hello? I live in Northern California, and I tend to drive at night for my job. I'm a delivery driver. I usually bring my boyfriend along for the sake of it, just to make us both feel better. Last night he saw something neither of us can explain. I'm hoping for some insight here. I'm going to try to make this as detailed as I can. We were driving home around 11 p.m. The road wasn't super busy and we have to drive by a half shit hole rail yard to get home. There's lots of trashed box cars. I had a terrible feeling of dread driving through there. Like, I just had to get the F out of there. I can't tell you why. I've grown up around creepy places my entire life. I used to live in the south, surrounded by nothing but fields and dirt roads. But last night, I felt absolutely terrified. We were about halfway home when my boyfriend gasped and became speechless. When he was finally capable of speaking, he told me he saw something that's hard to describe. It was on its hind legs, standing on a trashed-out boxcar. It had features like a cat or a rabbit. It was about waist-high. It wasn't particularly tall. It had an extremely round face. It started running super fast on two legs when it saw us. It wasn't quite human, but wasn't quite animal either. It was bipedal. I looped back around after he had calmed down. We drove back and forth a couple of times, both of us terrified, but we wanted an explanation. Maybe it was a trick of the light. We couldn't find anything. I have no clue what that animal was, but I hope for insight here. Hopefully an animal. Does this sound like what I fear it to be? It was in a very rural area with lots of farmland close to the borders between California, Arizona, and Mexico. But I was on the California side. My family dad, older sister, and older sister's girlfriend. And I were in the car at night on our way back to my sister's house from the nearest town. We went there to eat dinner at a restaurant since the small town around my sister's house doesn't have much other than a bait and tackle shop and a gas station. On the way, we had to pass a couple of miles of farmland and drive on dirt roads, which gets a little scary, especially at night. I was in the front passenger seat and my sister was in the back behind me. We were looking at a star map on my phone since we could see a lot of stars in that area and wanted to see if we could identify anyone our dad who was driving suddenly swerved and freaked out a little. I heard a weird whimper and growl, which made me think we hit a dog, but my dad said there was a really messed up looking white thing running directly at our car. However, we didn't hit it because he swerved. 
My dad described it as big as a pit bull with a bear-like snout, pale white hairless skin, and very human-looking feet and long fingers and toes, almost like the werewolves in low-budget movies where you can tell it's a human in a wolf costume. My sister and I were too preoccupied looking at the star map to notice anything but the growl, but my sister's girlfriend caught a glimpse of it and said all she saw was a white dog running towards us. I started freaking out, but also super interested to have such a strange encounter, thinking it could have been a skinwalker or chupacabra. My dad was very adamant that it wasn't a regular dog or coyote. A couple of days later, I was jokingly looking up pictures of supposed skinwalkers and chupacabras, showing my dad each one, laughing like, is this what you saw? Until I got to one picture... His face dropped and he got goosebumps. Holy shit, that's exactly it. My dad is a very calm dude and I rarely see him freaked out about things or even show any kind of intense emotions, but I could tell he was seriously freaked out about it. I also looked up noises of coyotes, hyenas, wolves, and bears, and the closest match to what I heard was a hyena growling, not the whooping and laughing sound they make. I've never heard of a hyena in North America, and there weren't any zoos or wildlife preserves in the area, though the area is between two Native American reservations, which made me think at first that it could have been a skinwalker. I'm somewhat new to this, so let me know if this doesn't belong here. A little context before I get into it. My new house is fairly new, around three years old and in a new development located on native land in Texas. I usually listen to stories about spooky stuff on YouTube to help me sleep. Last night around midnight to 1 a.m., I went to my garage to get a bottle of water. As I opened the fridge door... I heard, can you help me? It sounded exactly like my niece, who lives with us. My first thought was to go to the hallway that leads to the garage to check on her. I heard it again, but it was coming from outside the garage door that leads to the driveway. Then a wave of fear and doom just washed over me. I immediately went back inside to check on my niece to see if she's okay. She was passed out in a room with her little sister. I checked our cameras but couldn't see anything on the screens, except our car is parked in the driveway. Part of me wants to say it's a skinwalker, but I'm not too sure they're here in South Texas. Our local native tribe was thought to be wiped out, but recently, with DNA tests, they have found a decent amount of people here have Karanka call ancestry. Any input would be helpful. Thanks, y'all. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia, United States of America. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased, but I stayed there for about a week, and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night very late and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night it was eerily dark too. The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight and all of a sudden I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair looking out into the dark forest trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. That's when I realized it wasn't just me. We then both heard a blood-curdling scream and we pulled out a flashlight to see what it was. Turns out it was a gray fox. They make scary screaming sounds. The weird part was that the fox was running and had its ears and tail down like it was scared. This was in June, and I read that foxes scream like that when it's mating season or if they're in danger. 
Their mating season is winter, and this happened in June. So I do believe this fox was in danger or, or afraid, as well adding to our fear, the cabin has three floors. And we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof because we wanted to still be outside and relax. Didn't matter how high up I was, I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil or like someone was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions that often. Maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. It felt unnatural. I had a couple of experiences in the 1970s. I was nearly moved to what was then a fairly wooded area of Provo, Utah, on the northwest side. My mom and I lived on a main artery of town, with woods going down to the Provo River. A couple of my girlfriends from high school had spent a Saturday night at my house. That Sunday morning, we walked down to the fields and apple orchards in back of our house, which went back several acres. We had just gone between two old outbuildings and were about to open the gate to go into the orchard over the irrigation creek when all three of us heard an extremely loud growl and howl come from the building to our right. It didn't sound like a dog or have that wild, crazy cry of a coyote. It sounded to all three of us exactly like the howling of a wolf. We looked at each other and split running for the house. We were the only ones home. We locked the doors, pulled down the shades, and huddled in the living room, trying to figure out what we had heard. All three of us were experienced campers, and we had heard all sorts of animals on these trips, and many of the camping trips had been the three of us together. This sounded weird, sort of extremely loud, but yet muffled, like listening to a kid's talking into the old string and canned phones. Tape recorders were cassettes or real to real at that time. There was no way someone was hiding in that building playing a tape recorder. There was no electric feed to those buildings. They were boarded up and padlocked. There were no loose boards or holes, something like a big dog or even a cat could get in there. You would have needed to have an amplifier or a speaker cranked up to get that sort of volume. My mom found us sitting in the front room in the dark, and we were really hesitant to tell her what we had heard for obvious reasons. She sort of blew it off. We never did find out anything on it. The adults that we asked about it said it was our imagination. To this day, the three of us still talk about that incident. The second incident happened in 1977. I was in college then, and now living in a massive apartment complex in the southwest part of Provo. My mom and I had gone to bed around nine. We were both awakened at 1 a.m. to growling, whining, and that same loud, freaking howling right outside the sliding glass door in my bedroom. We could hear something large out there. It let out this blood-curdling howl almost exactly like what my friends and I had heard a few years earlier. My mom wanted to look out the window. I had two small adult dogs at the time, and they had dove under the bed, silent, and wouldn't come out for hours. I told her, don't look out the window. I didn't want to see this thing, but more to the point, I didn't want it to see us. We could hear it whining and growling, running off through the parking lot, eventually fading away. We didn't sleep that night. The next morning, I knocked on our neighbor's door and asked if they had heard a dog howling in our adjoining backyard. He said no. He'd slept peacefully. It was hard for me to believe he hadn't heard it because it had been so loud and weird. I told my mom what he had told me, and she couldn't believe anyone could have slept through that. We stayed up the next night and waited. We couldn't sleep. I had since tacked down my drape, so uh, whatever it was couldn't peek in. So we drank coffee in the front room in the dark and watched the clock. Right at 1 a.m. it started again. Again the dogs froze and suddenly darted noiselessly under the table and shook. This time the whining of whatever it was almost sounded like a baby crying. There was growling, and then it began to howl and... Midway through the howl, it stopped suddenly, like something had startled it. We heard a rustle and loud thumping running. 
Again we heard the weird baby cry and whine fade off through the grass going west. We never heard it again after that. I guess I am basically posting this experience to see if anyone has any more information as to what it was or has experienced it themselves in the Provo area. It definitely left an impression on us three high school friends that we're still trying to puzzle out even now in our mid-sixties. Thank you for your thoughtfulness in reading my experience. My name is Mike Halloran, a hard-boiled detective from the city. I've solved more crimes than I can count, seen more things than most men would care to, but none of it prepared me for the quaint Midwestern town of Maple Ridge. Maple Ridge was a place where everyone knew everyone, and an eerie hush descended on it after sundown. But a series of bizarre disappearances had thrust this quiet town into the spotlight, Unexplained disappearances of people of color had me packing up my city life and heading straight into the heartland. And as if that wasn't strange enough, each disappearance was preceded by a blackout that plunged the whole town into darkness. The night I arrived, I was welcomed by an eerie spectacle, strange lights darting in the sky. As I watched, the lights vanished and a familiar darkness spread across the town. Then everything went blank. When I woke up, I was miles away from my initial location and another person had disappeared. My investigation led me on a twisted path. Every lead, every piece of evidence pointed toward something out of this world, something I never believed in, alien abductions. The evidence was there, but convincing my skeptical team was another story. They laughed it off, brushed it aside, until one by one, they too started disappearing. As the team dwindled, the truth unraveled itself in a way I couldn't have imagined. It wasn't aliens, but it was far from normal. The government was orchestrating these alien abductions. They were abducting people for some sickening experiment. I was furious, disgusted. I told them I'd expose their cruel games, bring their secrets to light, but they beat me to it. Before I could make a move, I found myself locked away, cut off from the world. They thought they could silence me. They thought they could bury the truth. They were wrong. They've locked away the man. But the truth, the truth is out there, waiting to be discovered. I may be locked up, but I won't stop fighting. Because the truth, the truth never stays hidden for long. Behind the iron bars of my confinement, I could only watch as the world carried on, oblivious to the grim truth I had unearthed. But I knew I couldn't sit idly by, not while the government played God using innocent lives for their twisted experiments. My captors, smug in their belief that they had secured their secrets, were complacent. I, on the other hand, had spent years outsmarting the cleverest of criminals, and I wasn't about to be outdone. The concrete walls and steel bars were a challenge, but not an impossible one. Day by day I started formulating a plan. The guards were punctual to a fault. The CTV cameras had a blind spot and the evening meals came without fail at 7 p.m. sharp. There was a pattern, a rhythm I could exploit. I was careful, patient. Time was a luxury I had and I wasn't about to squander it. My chance came one rainy evening. A guard, new and inexperienced, left his post a minute too early, creating a lapse in their otherwise meticulous routine. I seized the opportunity. Using a makeshift tool I had been secretly working on, I unlocked my cell and slipped into the Keteve blind spot. I moved through the sterile corridors, my heart pounding. It felt good to be back in the field, even if the circumstances were dire. Using the guard's predictable patterns to my advantage, I made my way to the control room. Once inside, I quickly disabled the alarms and surveillance cameras. My years on the force had made me adept at navigating such systems. I was in and out in minutes, leaving no trace of my presence. With the alarms and cameras down, I had a small window of opportunity. I found the files I needed evidence of the government's horrific experiments and made a dash for the exit. 
The rain was pouring down when I emerged into the cold night. The facility was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by miles of barren land. But I didn't mind the isolation. I was free, and I had the proof to bring them down. My fight isn't over yet. I need to get these documents to the public, let them see the truth hidden beneath the cover of alien abductions. I may be a fugitive now on the run from the very institution I once served, but I won't rest until the truth is out there. I am Mike Halloran, and I'm just getting started. I'm a 62-year-old man who has seen lots of things in my life. My mother and my grandmother were Cree natives. My mother told me one day a story from her grandmother about the Wendigo and how it related to our people. She would always warn me to beware of the Wendigo. I joined the Canadian Armed Forces when I came of age. My folks drove me to the gate to walk into my new life. My mom told me, I'm proud of you, my son. I'm sure you will do well. Just be careful when you're out in the wild. Watch for the wind to go. After my basic training, I was sent on a tradesman course, and then to my first post. I was assigned to the Special Service Forces in Petawawa, Ontario, as a communication specialist, since my job included fixing telecommunication equipment. I had a top-secret security clearance. We trained hard when I was there and I was ready to go head to head with whatever enemy I would encounter in my missions. One day in December, we were transported via helicopter on a mountaintop close to Algonquin Provincial Park for a week of winter warfare courses. During this week of training, we each had to do guard duty at night. On one of those nights at around 2 a.m., I started hearing strange voices down the mountain. That night, the temperature was around minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. At first, I checked to see that everyone was sleeping in their tents. They were all accounted for. I scanned the area to see if I could locate someone. There was nobody there, at least no one that I could see with my military-issue flashlight. I continued hearing those voices for a while, so I decided to call out to wh whoever was there. Hello. Who goes there? You're on a Canadian Armed Forces base. Identify yourself. No answer. I kept looking for whatever might be there, but I was still hearing those voices that sounded Asian. Some came from the right, others from the left. They seemed like they were having some kind of conversation. Since it was a training and learning exercise, we had no ammo in our weapons. Not knowing what to expect, I did the second best thing I could do. I fixed the bayonet and kept walking around the camp. The voices stopped after a while. I was wondering who in the right mind would hike into the wilderness for at least 20 miles in such miserable weather just to pull up a prank on us. That week they closed down the base two times because it was so cold. Of course we stayed on a mountaintop. It was part of the training, they said. My replacement came after a while and when he showed up the first thing he asked me was what I was doing with a bayonet on my weapon. I didn't want to say I was hearing voices down below us. I told him it was so cold that I decided to do some drill movements to warm myself up. I don't know if he believed me. The next month, there was a huge military exercise in Wainwright, Alberta. The entire brigade ended up there. One day, I was going on a call with my partner to do a repair on a piece of equipment that was out in the middle of nowhere. We had been driving for about 45 minutes in deep snow and could not find the equipment. I was driving and decided to stop and check our location to find our target. My partner was looking at a topographical map while I was trying to see if I could locate a reference point. On our right, there was a forested area with pine and underbrush. On the left, there was an open field. At about a hundred feet from the tree line at my ten o'clock position, there was a large white-tailed buck foraging in the snow. The deer was facing us and looking out in our direction. Then, out of nowhere, a huge creature blasted out of the tree line and aimed directly toward the grazing deer. It took less time for the beast to cover the approximate 100 feet of the deer than it took for me to tell my partner to look. The beast grabbed the deer by the head. It was taller than the deer by about two feet. It was reddish, 
brown in color, with very wide shoulders. The head was pointed and was set on the shoulders without a neck. The arms were long and muscled. The legs were like 55 gallon drums and the body was covered with long hair. I wish I had more time to look at it and get more details, but everything went so fast. As soon as the beast reached the deer, it placed one hand on the top of the deer's head and the other at the back of the neck, then twisted it like it was a rag. Without even stopping it, headed back into the woods with the deer over its shoulder. I put the truck in gear and said, let's get out of here. My partner managed to find the trail leading to our destination, and we found the equipment. When we made our way back to the bivouac area, my sergeant asked me if everything went okay. I told him I don't know what I saw on our way to the other location, but it was pretty freaky. He looked at me and said that he didn't want to hear about it, so I kept it to myself, and I walked away. As time went on, and as I grew older, I realized that I had witnessed a Sasquatch harvest that deer. I had a nice career in the Army. I did some missions and went on several in peacekeeping missions throughout the world. I saw a lot of strange animals and witnessed many unusual situations. But that beast in Alberta was the one that I will never forget. I've lived in Idaho all my life and spent a lot of time outside or in the wilderness as a kid. My grandparents would take me camping and my older brother and I would always hike up whatever trail we could find to get a view of the sunset. On one of these occasions, something terrifying happened. We were up at a campsite I only know as Warm River. The river there never freezes over, and my brother and I were on a regular evening hike. There was an old tunnel bored through the mountain at one part of the trail, probably an old train tunnel, and we were walking through it when I heard something I'll never forget. After walking through probably two-third of the way through the tunnel, I heard a terrible screech at the end we entered through. The screech wasn't like anything I'd heard before. I've heard the screams of animals on dark and windy nights. I even think I've heard Bigfoot calls a few times, but never the metallic grinding screech I heard that day. The point is, whatever the sound was, it did not sound natural in any capacity. I probably jumped five feet in the air when I heard it, and my brother shouted a few choice curses before shooing me quickly to the exit of the tunnel. At this point, my brother decided we should just continue walking and head back after whatever made the noise hopefully cleared out. We didn't have any firearms on us, so I was pretty upset. My brother reassured me we would be fine, and we made the walk back without incident. However, I didn't get any sleep that night. Whether it was the thing that screeched at us or just my imagination, I heard things moving around the campsite the whole night, as well as whispers echoing through the darkness outside the trailer. I woke my brother up a few times to check out what it was, but he refused each time, telling me that it was probably just other campers staying up late and enjoying themselves. The rest of the trip was pretty normal. We packed up the following day, and my life continued as normal. I was disconcerted, but chalked what happened up as a harmless event that I must have been exaggerating in retrospect. A few weeks later, I went up to Pine Basin, an old ski lodge my family rented each year for family reunions. Here I would mess around with my cousins, our favorite activities being night games. We would play hide-and-seek a game called Ghosts in the Graveyard, and other games like that. In one instance, I was chosen to be the seeker for a hide, and eat game. Because I was one of the younger cousins, I got a flashlight as an advantage. Normally, all the younger cousins hid close to the lodge, and the older cousins hid in the trees or at the base of the nearby mountain. As I was searching near the bottom of the mountain, I heard a familiar whistle up the mountain a bit. We would always whistle as a hint at our location. It sounded like someone was hiding way up near a tree known as the underwear tree. You can guess why. So I began trekking up toward the whistle. As I climbed closer, I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I continued on warily and convinced myself that I would be fine. 
I hated walking in the night alone, but figured whoever I find would walk me back to the lodge. As I neared the tree, I noticed that it was deathly silent. This alerted me that something was very wrong because you could always hear the adults having fun back at the lodge. I was anxious to hurry back, so I called out. I found you, Scott. I thought the whistle was my older cousin's. Come back down with me. I got no reply, but I wasn't planning on waiting. As I began walking back down the path, I heard a voice call you almost had me. So I ran back up to investigate. I flashed my light in the branches of the tree and saw a monstrosity that was not my cousin. It looked like a poorly drawn stick figure made into a human with its emaciated figure and lifeless eyes. I remember its face looked like the skin on its head was being pulled from behind. It had torn and stretched features. As soon as I saw the creature, I screamed, dropped the flashlight, and ran back to the lodge. The entire time I ran, I was overcome by an overpowering smell, and I could hear the thing running after me. As I approached the camp, I saw a few people, my cousins, at the bottom of the mountain waiting for me. I was crying and shaking, and they took me inside. I told my dad what happened, but my cousins all said they didn't see anything following me. The adults kept us inside for the night, and I kept hearing sounds drifting in from the mountains. I never played night games after that happened, and was always terrified that my cousins wouldn't listen to my warnings. Ever since that night, I have always felt uneasy up in those mountains. I used to be really religious, and figured it was a demon of some kind trying to kill me or something like that. But those mountains have never felt the same after that incident. A few years ago, the game Until Dawn became really popular, and I watched a walkthrough of it on YouTube. When the Wendigo first appeared in the game, I got chills down my spine. It was exactly what I saw, and I did a ton of research on them. I figure someone must have gotten snowed in at that old lodge and resorted to cannibalism, but that doesn't explain what happened at Warm River. I still hear that screech from time to time. It never occurred to me until watching until dawn that they might be from the same thing, and it scares the hell out of me every time. I heard it earlier tonight, and that's why I decided to finally write my story down. When I was 16, I went out with my friends, Jay and Harley, to a large park with a lake and massive grass hills. It was already dark since it was winter, and we sat down to talk after finishing school. We were situated on a hill with a forest to our right and thick grass bushes behind us. While we were chatting, Jay, who was the loud one in our group, started whistling and shouting due to the echo it created. Suddenly, we all heard the same whistle back at us from behind the bushes. We were confused because we knew it. It couldn't have been the echo. Jay shouted at the sound to provoke it, which frightened me. After a while, something screamed back at us, faint but clear, making my heart drop. Jay then suggested we go investigate, and we followed him. As we walked closer to the bushes, we strayed off towards the exit passage, telling him we should leave. However, he claimed to see eyes and something darted at him. We all ran through the passage, and Jay was screaming while me and Harley were in disbelief. Once we reached the road, we looked back and shouted Jay's name. After five minutes, he stumbled out of the darkness and fell to our feet. We walked away from there as fast as we could, not talking about what had happened. The next day, we met up again and found out that Jay was covered in black and yellow bruises. I have no evidence to prove this story, but I wanted to share it nonetheless. In this case, it's not something I saw, but something I didn't see. Girlfriend and I were in the Tetons last summer when we had to make a pit stop near the end of our week-long camping trip. We turned into the Spread Creek campground area to get away from the traffic on the main road going towards Jackson. We found out later that our discreet pea spot was only 25 yards away from where Gabby Petito's body was eventually discovered. This was only a day after she was last heard from again, so she was likely already laying there. 
felt horrible and helpless to learn what happened to her after the fact, especially since we were only a stone's throw away. So I was hiking in north-central Pa Forest country with my girlfriend. Weekend hike, like 30 miles. In the middle of an absolutely black moonless night, I couldn't sleep. She was lightly sleeping next to me. I was lying there listening to the sounds of the woods with my eyes open or closed. It was the same either way. Then, I saw a light moving in the distance through the Cuban mesh tent fabric. It was a small dim light that looked like a flashlight being carried. I thought it might be a park ranger. I see those guys from time to time. I thought it might be a night hiker. I do that sometimes. I had no idea what it was, but I was absolutely certain it was headed towards us. The light followed a roughly wave-shaped path through the trees, meandering slowly in our direction. I called out to it and woke up my girlfriend. I shouted, hey, and stuff like that. I verified with her that we were both awake and both seeing the same thing. It moved silently. There is no question that whatever it is, it knows we are there and absolutely is coming over to inspect us. I was freaking out a little, shouting, go away. She yelled at it. I was too chicken shit to unzip the tent and confront it. I'm not kidding you. I was terrified. The light approached the tent, did a circle around us, and left the way out came, floating up and down, snaking its way back into the forest without a sound. We were completely shaken by the experience, but it was over and we had zero answers. After the hike, we asked the rangers at the station if anyone had reported seeing floating lights, but they just looked at us like we were high, sober as a judge the whole trip. For two years, I sat with that experience in my brain, until it happened again. Same girlfriend, same tent, same time of night, different forest, still north central pa. Same kind of weekend, loop hike. We saw it again. Through the thin fabric of our tent, the light was blurry but unmistakable. And again, it floated towards us, up and down. Then it made contact. It landed on the tent. It was a firefly. It had always been a firefly. Sometimes fireflies leave their butts on for extended periods of time when they're lost in searching for others. My tent had reflectors on the zippers and lines. The bugs saw their own reflection and came to investigate. For two years, I thought I had seen the supernatural. One night in the summer, when I was about 10 or 11, I was awake in the middle of the night and I could hear the horses running around the pasture as if something had happened. I decided to get up and go check on things. At that time, my family had a massive old barn and we lived in the middle of nowhere. I walked through the door of the barn and found a very large man, as white as snow, climbing into the hayloft. I remember being startled, but not scared. He turned around, looked at me, and slowly lowered himself back. He took a few steps before he knelt down and put out his hand, like one would do with a stray animal. As I looked at him, I felt like he looked sad and tired, and not at all like he would do me any harm. I decided to take his hand and walk him toward our kids' hangout space, which was just a space in the barn where we had some old couches, a few toys, and a radio. As soon as he saw the radio, he became more animated, ran towards it, and started messing around with it. That went on for a bit, and I kept asking him what he needed the radio for. He never said a word. Not one word. He wouldn't give me a name, so I started calling him Radio. After some time, he set the radio down and sat down on the couch. I brought over my favorite horse book and started thumbing through the pages, showing him all of my favorite horse breed. Eventually, he gently took the book from me and closed it as if to say I'm done. I got up to put the book away, and he lay down on the couch. I remember him being so large that his head was on the armrest, while his legs hung over the other armrest at the knee. He was a giant, pure white, and I don't recall any hair. His eyes were jet black, but they weren't huge or angular. 
If anything, they slanted downward and were beady. After he fell asleep, I decided to go back in the house and go to bed, but I put a blanket over him before I went in. I woke up in the morning and the whole experience came flooding back to me. My feet were dirty as if I had been outside during the night. I grabbed some snacks and ran out to the barn. I ran to our hangout space and found everything as I would have expected it. The blanket was on the floor, the book was sitting on the table, and the radio was out of place, but he was gone. It's important to know that I had a habit of sleepwalking at this time in my life, so it's possible that this was all just a dream. At first I thought he was just a very strange person, and I hoped he found safety. The memory never left me, and by the time I was a teen, I had decided that I'd dream the whole thing and let it go. Then the film Prometheus came out, and I agreed to go see it with friends. When the tall white alien came on the screen, I nearly jumped out of my seat. It wasn't an exact likeness, but it was like seeing a ghost. At the time, I knew absolutely nothing about aliens, and the only one I had ever heard of was the classic little green men. Nonetheless, I forced myself to let it go and move on. That memory could not be real, so I must have dreamed it. As time passed, I started wondering how I could have imagined a being that I had never heard of. Could that have really happened? Could radio be real? Has anyone else had an experience like this? Me, Glenn, and our friends Larry and Katrina were camping near the Malala site two years ago on March 2, 1996. But we were further down Copper Creek Road, about five, six miles away. We set up camp at an old gravel pit with a creek behind it, and it was right next to the road. At around 10, 11 p.m., we heard a loud scream coming from down in the canyon. It was so loud it made the hairs on the back of our neck stand up. Later that night, we heard another scream, but this one was closer. We were so scared that we all stayed in the truck that night. At around 2 a.m., our dog, who was tied to a nearby tree, started to go crazy and tried to get into the truck with us. We then heard two thuds which sounded really close, like a big limb breaking and hitting the ground. It was so terrifying that we couldn't go back to sleep for the rest of the night. The next night, we moved to a new locality at the end of a dead-end road nearby. This time, we saw something even more strange. There were lights hovering over the trees, lighting them up. The lights were just above tree height and made no sounds. We all stood there in awe, trying to figure out what we were seeing. It was like nothing we had ever seen before. We stayed up for the rest of the night, afraid to close our eyes and miss anything. We never did figure out what was causing all of the strange occurrences during that camping trip. It's something that still haunts me to this day. My brother-in-law and I were bow hunting in the Deschutes National Forest. There are endless amounts of dirt forest service roads throughout the central Oregon region. We would drive down these roads and find a promising spot, get out and walk the area. There are a lot of old fire areas and we found one we had not been to before it was a burnt out section of forest, approximately 1,500 acres in size located about two, three miles from the base of Paulina Peak and Newberry Crater and about one mile in from Highway 30, one and about one mile in from a dirt power line road and on the southwest section of the fire. The burned area was very wide open and we were near some small rock outcrops. There was a cat line road around the fire and this is what we parked on. It was approximately one and we had no luck so we decided to try one last place and then go home for the day, which is where I have described. We parked and got out quietly, and I headed into the woods on the other side of the road. I walked about 100 feet in and was startled by a dow jumping out of the brush and fleeing. We decided to go in the direction that the dow had gone thinking that there may be a buck somewhere nearby. 
My brother-in-law went off in the direction she thought the Dow had gone, and I stayed back and looked for tracks to see if there was others. This is when I noticed some very strange prints on the ground. They were like a human's footprint, but larger. There were about eight to twelve prints by one creature. As far as I could tell, the prints were not all in one direction. It looked as if the creature, animal, or whatever may have shifted its weight, or something when it turned, because the dirt was pushed up more on the outside of the print in place. I told my partner, and he didn't seem to be interested. He just kept looking for the deer. Then he finally came back up over the little rise, and I showed him the tracks. He didn't seem to know what to think. I kept studying them and tried to come up with an answer for them. I thought maybe the wind, but no, the chances of the wind making one, let alone eight twelve of the prints, was very unlikely. Or rain, but there is no way. Or a bear, but for a bear to be on its hind legs and to take that many steps was very, very unlikely. The prints, from what I remember, were about 12 to 15 inches in size, and some of the strides were possibly 4 to 4 and a one-half feet. We had been at this location for about 30 minutes when my brother-in-law said we should go. He sounded kind of shaky, which was very unusual for him. I asked him why, and he said we should go. So this got me kind of spooked for the first during this half hour. So we got in the car and left. We never saw a creature or heard any unusual sounds. Other than the prints, the only thing that seemed odd to me was that when we first got to this location is that it was very quiet. I've spent more than my share of time alone in the woods. But one occasion definitely stands out as the creepiest thing I've experienced while no one else was around. I have a friend that has 40 acres outside of town that he has slowly converted into a subsistence farm for his family. Years ago, when he mostly only had a dozen or so chickens out there, I spent a few months living on the property in a tent while I was between seasonal work. At the time, the property was decades, neglected, overgrown pasture land with a few clumps of denser woods. I had set up my tent and homestead right in the middle of the property in a small clear area between two densely wooded thickets. My friend would come by once a day to feed the animals, but other than that, there was zero chance of me seeing another human unless I left the property. I really enjoyed the solitude and had taken to observing nature in a way that I had never really done before. When the incident occurred, I had been living out there for about two months, so I was well used to the sounds of nature outside my tent at night. I had gotten to the point where I wouldn't even bother to get out of the tent and look if I heard a small animal walking past my tent at night. I would even gotten used to the sound that the roof of the pump house made when wind blew hard from the southeast. My friend had been short on nails when he was building the roof over the pump so the southeast corner wasn't nailed down and a strong wind would cause the corner of the corrugated metal roof to peel up and then crashed down loudly when the wind stopped. It was about 200 feet away from my tent, so it had caused me to jump a bit when I first moved out there, but within a month it had just become another sound outside my tent at, at night. It was even sort of comforting, like some people that live in big cities say that they can't sleep without the sound of traffic outside their window. It probably helped that the sound was always paired with the sound of wind blowing through the trees. So one night I'm tucked in my sleeping bag, starting to drift off when I hear the shed corner come crashing down. Nothing to worry about. I probably didn't even open my eyes. But then I hear what sounds like a person mimicking the sound the shed had made right outside my tent. My blood freezes in my veins, and my eyes open wide in the darkness, and I hold perfectly still. I know that my friend has already come and gone hours before. I am alone on a piece of land that is large enough that there is no reason for a person to accidentally end up next to my tent in the middle of the night. After a few moments, the wind makes the shed roof crash again, and again I heard a person mimic the crashing sound a few seconds later. I called out and asked if there was anyone there. 
No response. The shed roof crashed a third time, but this time there was no mimicking sound. So I am out of my sleeping bag and out of my tent, flashlight in one hand, camp knife in the other. I shine my flashlight right where the fake crashing sound seemed to come from. Nothing. It's the edge of the woods, but the sound had been close, and I can see you through the brush well enough to tell that there isn't a person hiding behind the bushes and low branches. I'm looking at the ground, and none of the dead leaves look particularly disturbed. I'm trying to figure out how far someone could have moved at a slow enough pace to not make enough sound for me to hear their footsteps on the leaf litter. Answer, not very far, when the shed roof crashes again. And I hear the same fake crash sound again, right next to me, where I am 100% positive there isn't a person standing. At this point, my heart is beating a mile a minute, and I am getting ready to believe in the supernatural. While sweeping my flashlight beam through the human free spot, the sound seemed to be coming from. I see a bird. It's sitting in the low branches of a tree at about head height. I stop moving the flashlight and keep the beam on the bird for a moment. The bird opens its mouth and makes the fake crashing sound. Oh, and the little guy stuck around for another month making the same sound, so I eventually got used to his sound at night as well but I resented it every time I heard it. This happened in 2021, when me and three of my friends decided to go out late at night to go for a walk through a forest in Mission, British Columbia, to a small lake in late at night. We were at the bushes before the train tracks, and we were standing there, contemplating whether it was a good idea or not to move forward with going into the forest past the train tracks. For some reason, we stood there and two of my friends felt uncomfortable that we were going to go in while my other friend and I were feeling adventurous and all up for the walk. So we stood there and we were like, why don't you guys want to go in? And you could just tell they felt uncomfortable and wanted to leave. So we waited a bit longer. Then both me and my other friend felt uncomfortable, and we decided it's not a good idea that we go. Then we heard a branch snap in the bushes a couple feet away from us, like something stepped on it, but there was no other sound. It was completely silent. It wasn't a small branch either, it was a thick one. It wasn't just a snap, it was a snap. No sound of bushes moving or any movement, like something was still in the bushes watching us. So we all decided it was no good, felt we were being observed by something or someone that could possibly be dangerous. And we took off back to the truck immediately and left, probably just an animal, but still who wants to take the risk of being stalked or mauled by an animal who was potentially observing you as a group. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.